Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place. We're so glad that you could join us. It's had a wonderful time in prayer, and we invite anybody um, who's listening uh, on Thursdays to come and join us from 6 to 7. And tomorrow morning, we, of course, pray from 10 to 12. And then on Saturday, we pray from 9 to almost 10, just before the meeting. And we've been opening up the building this week um, for anybody that wants to come in and pray. Just if you say, well, I just want to come in and pray, there's not going to be anybody leading you per se, but you're welcome to come uh, in here and pray in the sanctuary. There is an anointing here. There's a lot of prayer that goes on here, so uh, you might find it sometimes easier to pray here than other places. Just want to have an open sanctuary. And I believe the time will come when we have... um, we're able to just have it open 24-7, where it's just open where people can come and pray. So that day will come. Anyways, welcome, and let's begin. And we are going to talk about this in a minute, why you need the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about it for a few weeks. It's been really good. Um, I really, there's been some things that have come out that have just blessed me. Before we do that, I want to share a scripture with you tonight before we take the offering. It's one of my favorites. As a matter of fact, on my list of scriptures, it's the first one. And it's Proverbs 10.22. It's the blessing of the Lord. It makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So really, to be rich, we just need the blessing of the Lord, like in our lives, in our country. And rich doesn't necessarily mean a billionaire or anything. It just means having a full supply. The New International Version says, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. You ever do that where you just work day and night trying to, just, trying to get ahead? And there's nothing wrong with hard work, don't get me wrong, but the blessing of the Lord can bring it to you without that painful toiling. The New Living Translation says, The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Well, that's kind of similar with, yeah, I know, I'm just pounding it in. It's amazing, I'm always amazed at how little scripture people actually know or understand. The thing that amazes me even more, and it's not so much here, but is how little people understand the authority they have as believers. Like, I'm, I'm in shock sometimes when I hear people talk, I'm like, what? Like, people of faith, it always surprises me. The Amplified Bible says the blessing of the Lord brings true riches, true riches, and he has no sorrow to it. Like, not not the, you know, true riches aren't the kind where, you know, you you paint something and then you get a lot of money for it, and then it looks like your three-year-old painted it, and then somebody gets appointed to a high office for it. Anyways, the person who bought the painting... He has no sorrow to it, for it comes as a blessing from the Lord. And so that's, that's what people of this world don't understand, is that God wants to bless everybody. If everybody in the world gave their life to Christ and just cried out to Him and we drove the darkness out of the earth, everybody would be blessed. There would be no poverty. Wherever there, whatever there's poverty on the earth, the blessing of the Lord is not. Wherever the blessing of the Lord is, poverty is not. It's just the way that it is. How come America is so blessed? Because America built the foundation on the gospel. The pilgrims, I mean, we celebrate it as a nation. We celebrate Thanksgiving. Now, I realize that they're trying to change the name. And you know why they're trying to change the name? It's, it's Indigenous People Day. No, because, yeah, they didn't murder each other. They didn't raid each other's camp, murder, pillage, rape, steal people. No, they didn't do any of that. And I'll tell you something, those who walked in the gospel did not do that. Now, not everybody in America walked in the gospel, but those who did, did not do that kind of stuff. And then when you look at California, and you just have to understand this, my dear California friends, I, I relish looking at posts and things from my friends in Texas and other states because I just laugh. <laughs> and I go, is it really worth all the money you're saving to live in that garbage, you know, to live down there and and freeze in the winter and then sweat it out in the summer. Well, I have air conditioning. You want to stay in the house all day while we're walking by the lagoon? No, I don't think so. 
California is one of the most anointed places on the face of the planet. On the face of the planet. Anybody that tells you different has been listening to the devil. Some of the greatest moves of God ever. And I, I can't even remember all, I, I have them all listed, but all, so many great moves of God have come from the state of California. And one of the greatest, of course, went to all the earth, the Azusa Street Revival in 1906. But it wasn't just a, the outpouring of speaking in tongues, it was the, the unusual miracles with that that just went all, around, went all around the world. It reawakened the church to the baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when, you know, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. When people say, well, what did Jesus come to do? Well, he came to save us. But when they were talking about things he was promised to do, and John the Baptist, he's going, he goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm here to baptize the water, but there's one much greater than me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So the promise, the promises, and, and you know, were that that's what he was going to do. And, and Jesus, the last great day of the feast in John 7, he cried out. And he said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And it said, this, John says, this spake he of the Spirit which had not yet come because he had not yet been glorified. So we have this amazing gift of the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when it was released back on the earth, well, I shouldn't say because he never left, but when it was reestablished on the earth, it came out of Los Angeles. So you know how much the devil hates Los Angeles? He hates San Francisco, but we don't. And we're praying for them. Why? For what? For restoration. For move of God to transform them. And I'll tell you something else. The seeds of the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit are here in California. These are the seeds that are growing more than any other state. They're here. You know what else is here? There is a creativity here that other states don't carry. You know, Detroit carried that, that uh, building cars. You know, Henry Ford and they built the cars and and populated the country with cars that people could afford. Changed the way that everybody got around. People never traveled that far from their own home because they had to, it was on a horse or a wagon. Can you imagine sitting on one of those, you know, a few hours? No, it wasn't pleasant. This state has great, and I'm really, I'm really prophesying to you tonight. I started out saying one thing, but I'm prophesying to you about this state and the greatness of this state and the blessing of this state. And the demons are trying to bring up laws. They're trying to bring up laws to drive the financial people out of California so that it's completely broke and so that it, so that it just goes into poverty. God has a different plan for our state. If you don't think he's turning things around, he's turning things around. Even the gas here has gone down, which we'll touch on that in a second. So it's transforming. Yeah. All right. Now after that sidebar. Okay. Christian Standard Bible. The Lord's blessing and riches, and he adds no painful effort to it. I like that, because some people think, I just got to work day and night, and I'll work two jobs. And Listen, that's noble, and... I applaud that kind of effort, but I believe that God has a better way. I don't believe that God wants you to toil so much that you have no time to pray. You have no time for Him. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, when somebody said, come on, it reminds me of somebody this week, they had, they had, they had less work, so they were here at church praying. It's like, whoa, I love that. Like they didn't even think about it twice, like, oh, I got extra time, I'm going to pray. Holman Christian Standard Bible, Lord's blessing and riches and struggles add nothing to it. So the people that almost struggle that I'm going to fight it. No, the Lord will bless you. Just say, Lord, bless me. I receive your blessing. Matter of fact, say, Lord, I receive your blessing. Lord, I your blessing. I'm telling you, I was thinking about this while I was walking around the lagoon, smelling the ocean water, looking at the water, wearing my shorts and my short sleeve shirt, <clears throat> walking around. And thinking, man, I'm really glad I'm not in Texas where it's freezing. 
Montana, where my son lives, and it's freezing. I love Montana in the summer, but in the winter, oof. Man, I'm just I'm glad I'm not in Florida, you know, where another storm's hitting. And I'm just, <laughs> but I was thinking, I was thinking about the grace of God and how much how, how much grace He's had upon me. And and I know I told you that during the COVID time, and, and everybody could say, well, I was asking God for grace. I certainly I was for sure. And, and God told me, he said, he goes, it wasn't just that I was declaring scriptures and eating right and all those things, but he said, the reason that you got nothing, and I mean nothing, was by my grace. But it was the, the sense I was getting was, I want to do so much more for you or for the body of Christ by my grace, if my people would start to embrace it more and more. And when Rodney said he saw the angel of great grace, the angel usually stands right about here. And that angel, great grace, it is the angel of this house. And as you embrace that angel, great grace, I, I really believe that God is going to do some transformative miracles in our state, for our state, and for you as individuals. As I read this scripture tonight, some of you, you're not going to have to struggle for it. Some of you are going to end up with incredible wealth. There are going to be people that retire and go, oh, oh my God. I'm making more retired than I ever made when I was working. Like, like a thousand times more. I mean, that it's incredible things are coming. These are things I see as I pray and I walk the lagoon. <laughs> it's like I have supernatural imagery there. The Brenton Septuagint translation says, The blessing of the Lord is upon the head of the righteous. Everybody say, I am the righteous. I am the righteous. That's you. It enriches him and grief of heart shall not be added to it. I like that part. That tells me that God's going to do something about the tax system yeah. so that you don't have the grief of heart over that. Yeah. Are you praying about that, Bob? I ain't praying about that. Yeah. God, I can't believe it. Or I sounded like Kaylee there for a second. Whenever Kaylee gets kind of a little bit argumentative, her, her voice goes, yeah, it goes up high. <laughs> Contemporary English version, when the Lord blesses you with riches, you have nothing to regret. There's nothing to regret. Why? Because your soul's right. If your soul's not right, riches can destroy you. They can, they can destroy you. And there's a lot of people that God holds it back from them just because it will destroy them. And it's better to have your soul than have riches. I'll tell you that right now. But if you can get your soul in the right place, you can have riches too. The Dewey Ramus Bible, the blessing of the Lord maketh men rich. I mean, this one, and I, and I didn't put all the translations because there's too many, but this one is just so clear, the blessing of the Lord. Neither shall affliction be joined to them. So riches without affliction, that's pretty amazing. A lot of time you bring riches to yourself, there's all kinds of afflictions that come. It is the Lord, good news translation, it is the Lord's blessing that makes you wealthy. Hard work can make you no richer. So hard work, we know, is a good thing, but he's saying when the blessing of the Lord's on you, hard work can't add anything more. Last one. JPS Tonica, the 1917 version. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich, and toil adds nothing <clears throat> thereto. Sounds pretty good, right? So this doesn't mean it's just going to fall upon you. Now, sometimes it can fall upon you. I remember, and I remember in our Chatsworth house, and um, you know, there was a lot of expenses there. And we had a lot of bills, and we had been renting out another place out in um, uh, Carlsbad where my kids were. <clears throat> and um, there just wasn't enough money, but God spoke to me, and he said, I'm bringing in a Hollywood crew, and, um, and they're going to give you, you're going to get a lot of money from them. So sure enough, two weeks later, they come in, they're, they're filming a, a, a picture right next door at my neighbor's house, using her house. And they said, well, we'd like to use your house too, so we're going to pay you more than the other neighbors. <laughs> Say, we want to use your house as kind of like a, a little bit of a gathering place, and we're going to put the, um, what is that, that, where they get the food and all that, what do they call craft services? And by the way, you can have as much as you want, so I had free craft services every day. And it didn't affect me in my office or my workout room or anything, so... It didn't bother me at all. And I made a lot of money. It was nice. 
And I didn't have to do any extra toil for it. Just talk to people, which, which when I'm talking to people, they're going to learn things about God they didn't know before. They're going to learn things about prophecy and things that have happened in the country. And they did. Uh, you know what the one, the, one, the, the one gal, and she used our house as an office, she said, um, she kind of set up everything. She says, you know what the, you know what the crew calls you? She goes, there's one, in, there's one everywhere you, you film on location. They call you the angel of the block. God sets things up. There's no toil to it. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. Listen, it, I didn't do anything for that. There was almost zero effort for that. So God can do things for you, and he can bring things your way that will surprise you. I really believe that. But I'm, and I'm not saying don't work hard, by the way. I'm not saying that. Um, as Americans, we need, we need to, you know, we need to do some physical hard work because we, we sit a lot. And that's not good for your overall health. So I do, wanna, I do like to see people moving, and I, I like to move myself. Um, it's just good for you. It's just good for your body. Regardless, I don't care if you're walking or riding a recumbent bike or, you know, throwing stones at your neighbor because they annoy you. Now. <laughs> it's working out my arm, bub. The Patriots need a new quarterback. So. All right. So, so today, the last thing I'll say, we're going to take the offering in a second. Today, as I was um, coming here, I didn't plan to drive. I planned to take the train. But then I looked at the schedule, and there were going to be some uh, repair work on Saturday. And I still could have taken partway in the bus. But then, you know, I get a text from Julie. Hey, we're going to have... We're going to have cake uh, for Sammy's birthday at 5. I'm like, I'll never make it home on the train. So I just said, I'm going to drive. So last minute today, I'm pulling in. I'm getting gas. And I'll use Kaylee's car because it takes regular. And um, then you do cash at that particular station. It's like 20 cents less. And so I go in there, and I'm paying four nineteen a gallon. And I remember not that long ago, I was paying six sixty four a gallon, about a year or so ago. And um, I remember before all this started, when I was buying premium gas, I was paying three twenty a gallon. So, but I'm looking at it coming down. What have we been prophesying? It's coming down. And Jay just told me this, and I know the station she's talking about. It's in uh, on Devonshire and uh, DeSoto, I want to say the Shell station. They pro- usually have the lowest prices in the valley. She said it was in the threes, three something, I don't know, 390 or whatever, 90. But that's, that's amazing. So God is hearing our declares, and I don't even say God is hearing them. As sons of God, we're making declarations and they're transforming things. Because you, you can listen to the news and you can prophesy what they're saying, you can prophesy what God's saying. And as we talked about last, uh, last Saturday or the Saturday before, when you're giving your offering and you bring it to the Lord, that's the time that you can begin to talk or speak what you want God to rebuke for your sake. And that's what we've been doing. And if you've noticed, every time we've done it, everything we've been saying has been happening. So we're going to do it again some more. All right. So with that, we're going to receive the offering tonight. So if you are making out a check, make it out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries. And if you're giving by text, it's right up there on the thing, and you can scroll down to either one of those. And I know you guys get ready pretty quick, so we're going to pray. I believe, I, I know that, I know you believe, but I know you believe more this week than you ever have, that what you're saying is going to come to pass. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father. We are so grateful grateful. that you gave us us. such great blessings in our life. So we give from that place of blessing, blessing. joyfully, Joyfully. not grudgingly, not Not because we have to, to. because we want to. to. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our our brother, brother, our high priest, We ask you to receive our tithes and offerings. 
present them unto our Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor. And we thank you, Father, that you are a quick witness and a judge against the sorcerers and the witchcraft and those that are in poverty, that you're bringing judgment against the darkness. So we humble ourselves by proving you in this way. And we receive the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive for the United States of America, for the state of California. We thank you for the abundant provision of rain that you're continually bringing to California. And Father, we thank you that you rebuke the devourer for our sake. We thank you for rebuking the inflation. We thank you for rebuking high energy prices. Not just gas, but all high energy prices. Electricity, natural gas. We thank you for rebuking high energy prices. And we thank you for rebuking crime in the state of California. We thank you for bringing it down, bringing law and order to our state. We believe you for that, and we receive it done in Jesus' name. All right, let's just go ahead and receive the offering. Hey, he said, he said, I'll be a swift, he goes, I'll be a swift witness against that stuff. So he will. God will take care of that. All right. As the ushers are doing that, I want to speak about the Holy Spirit moving in the church. And I, I, I love what we've done the last couple of weeks. We've kind of done something where I'm, I'm, I'm really teaching people how to speak from their spirits corporately. The last two Saturdays at the end of the meeting, and, and I think we turned the we did turn the cameras off because, you know, I don't want people to be weird about it or, you know, if they're not used to it, be panicked about it. But I was really blessed at how people really spoke from their spirits, uh, that they're picking it up. When you pray in tongues, you're speaking from your spirit. And if you just don't get in your head too much, if you pray, God, give me interpretation, and you just keep speaking... The first few words, they may not be anything much, but there'll be words from the Spirit that start to come out of your mouth. Now, listen, they're not going to necessarily be words of wisdom. And on the third day of the fifth month, I'm going to... No, those are like words of wisdom, you know, things from the future, things that God gives to prophets. But, but you are going to have a spirit of prophecy, you know, that flows on you. And we could see that. You could see that taking place. So... In these teachings of the Holy Spirit, I believe it's going to give you guys a heads up on that, on, on just moving with the Spirit every time we talk about it. So we're going to look a little bit tonight at the Holy Spirit moving in the church, and we did cover the first several chapters, and then we kind of reverted to some of the other scriptures in the epistles. So now we're kind of coming back to the book of Acts and to the sixth chapter. It says, Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander... And as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? This was the raising up of the man that was lame from his mother's womb at the, outside the temple. It says, Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody in authority that could do something to you? It can make you a little bit nervous. It can make you, you know, a little bit quiet. Or, well, excuse me, but I... I... But something happened here. Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he spoke from that place. Now, this is not, this is not prophecy. This is not tongues interpretation. He is speaking by the Spirit, though. So it's coming from a similar place. He said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. These people could have brought judgment on him. You understand that. 
If we be, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. <laughs> He's preaching to the leaders about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now they knew that it happened, but this is the first time they were confronted by it face to face after a miracle. He said, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which became the head of the corner. He's literally giving prophecy. He's describing prophetic words to them. And he's an unlearned man. He's not a doctor. He's not a lawyer. He's not somebody that's studying day and night, that knows the scriptures inside and out. That's the Apostle Paul. But that's not Peter. He's a fisherman. Now, did he know scriptures? Yes, because everybody that grew up in that community knew the scriptures. But not like these guys. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke boldly to these people who were much, much better versed in the scripture than he was. Then we go down to verse 29, same chapter. After they had let them go, they, they said they beat them and they let them go and said, don't talk anymore in this name. And so they began to pray this prayer, and this was toward the end of the prayer, said, now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Well, if you could just do it by accident, then you wouldn't need to pray that prayer, would you? So sometimes we need to pray, God, give us boldness. Well, how do you want us to speak with boldness? Um, by stretching forth thine hand to heal. Now, this is something that you're really going to have to understand this coming year, 2024. You're going to see healings right here. Maybe the likes of which you've never seen. And you're going to see them other places. They're going to be happening. Because that's how the gospel truly comes. The gospel is preached with a stretching forth of the hands to heal. That is the sign of the gospel. Now there is a, I don't want to call it a false gospel, but it almost is. There is a gospel that denies the power thereof. Paul said, turn away from that gospel. So there are churches all across America, and people look at those churches, and Hollywood looks at those churches, and they're powerless, and they see them as just kind of soul crutches. But the true church is not a soul crutch. The true, the true church is a church of miracles, signs, and wonders. The true church is a church of healing. But I'm telling you this. You have to break certain spiritual powers to have healing. Because demons, demons, if they allow healing, the masses start to go, hey, I want some of that. Now the scribes, the Pharisees, no, they're, they're not going to have anything to do with it. But the just come as I am crowd, you know, just, just come and give your life to Jesus and you'll go to heaven one day. That's not, that's not what the sons of God are here to do. We're here to pray. Now, now, maybe not all of you are going to be the ones lay, doing the laying on of hands. Maybe you will, but you can. But I'll tell you what, your prayers are going to be transformative. Well, just need to understand that. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. The power of the Holy Ghost came in, shook that place, and they, and you know what? They were full of the Holy Ghost, and they were speaking the word of God with boldness. There was no shyness. There's such a spirit over our nation. It's this false reasoning spirit. Everything, everything must be reasoned. We're Greek thinkers. You know, we're not, we don't think things about miracles and, and the church. Um, yeah, they're soul crutches. It's a new age kind of a thing. It's a secularism. A human secularism. And you cannot buy into that. We have to be the representatives of a supernatural kingdom of God and a supernatural church. The unsupernatural church is going to go the way of Satan. 
And, and listen, <laughs> I better not say that. <laughs> My neighbor just told me something about a whole denomination that has just embraced homosexuality. And you have to understand, that's, a, like, that's at the top of the demonic list of things that Satan wants to do. That's number two next to abortion. Well, Bob, you know, we need to be, you know, we need to be, uh, 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 Leah, I mean, uh, we can't be judgmental against the LGBTQ crowd. <laughs> if we don't break the demonic strongholds, I'll just tell you this. Don't be mad at those people because they're just deceived. If we don't break the demonic strongholds and they hold on to those spirits and those demons, they're going to end up in hell. For eternity, that's ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I don't want that. And I don't want that because there are demons on the earth trying, thinking they can overturn God's kingdom. Weren't they, weren't they shocked the day that Jesus rose out of the grave? Oh, that brought them a shock. Not only that, but what he, when, he, when he led captivity captive, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave... He took, it from the, he took it from the enemy. So people don't, realize, people don't realize who Adam was when God created him. In the book of Luke it says, Adam was the son of God. Adam was the son of God. No, Bob, no, no, no. Jesus is the son of God. Oh, yes. He was the word of God who became the son of God. But Adam was the first son of God. He was above the angels. God had created a realm completely just for him. And then he took from him DNA. He took the feminine nature from him and he created the woman and he made them one. And he said, I give you power to create sons of God. What? Power to create. A man and a woman has the power to create sons of God. <laughs> That's extraordinary. The angels don't have that power. And Paul says, when it's all said and done, he goes, you'll be like the angels in that sense in that you won't have that power to create or the right to do it. Now, obviously, the watchers, which, were, which made a decision, they were here to watch the earth, they were here to watch man to help him. They made a decision, 200 of them, that they wanted families. They wanted to be able to create families, but when they, they couldn't do it with each other, so they knew that, that the women had the power to give birth. So they had relationships with the women, and they created families, except the families became perversions of what original man was. They became the Nephilim. They became the giants. And there aren't just, listen, the Nephilim and the giants, and of course, when Ian's here, I want you to make sure you ask him that question, uh, which he's going to be here in May, by the way. But when the Nephilim and the giants, you say, what's the difference? Well, some of them are around anywhere from 9 to 14 feet, but then they have the giants are up to 35 feet. Also, they're different creatures, different beings. In the Catalinas, they have a race of people that were in the, around eight foot tall. They've got hundreds of skulls of them from a burial site. Well, I've never heard about... No, you never will. Because anybody that's anti-God doesn't want you... They don't want to talk about the giants because the Bible talks about them. But you go read your history books. The, the early explorers, they all came across the giants. 16, 18 feet tall. Even Amerigo Vespucci... You know, the one who our country's named after, Cortez, all these guys came across giants. And I mean, there are stories of, of things that happened to them where they're almost killed by them and so on, and where they tried to capture some of them. It's a very interesting thing. Anyways, I don't want to get into that too much. But what I, I, wanna, I want you to understand is Adam was the son of God. Even at that point in time, he was the height of God's creation. (sighs) 
And when the enemy deceived him, deceived the woman, you know, if she would have eaten, but Adam would not have eaten the man, we wouldn't be in this mess. She was deceived. But he was not. doesn't say he was. It says she gave to him and he did eat. I don't, know what, I don't know what he saw maybe happened to her. He didn't want to be separated from her. Remember, she was the closest being to him. And it said the voice of the Lord came in the garden the cool day. So the living presence of God wasn't with him all the time like the Holy Ghost is with you all the time. Wow. We're better off than Adam. Well, I don't think so, Bob. <laughs> should look at my gas bill. <laughs> We're better off. We got the Holy Ghost with us 24 7. Adam didn't have that. But he was such a lofty being. He was the height of the creation of God. And when he was tricked, when he was, I should say the woman was tricked, when he when he ate of the tree, his sin went into the very heavens and polluted the heavenly altars of worship to God. That's why it says that the blood of Jesus cleansed the heavenly utensils of worship. How could it do that? Because of the status of who Adam was. Bob, I don't feel anything like that. I know. But you're more. And we don't know who we are. And then we listen to the news and then we say, well, everything's going to hell in a hand. It's all bad. And we just mimic these voices instead of declaring what the earth is. But every day I'm declaring what the earth is. Yeah. And I'm declaring what California is. Yeah. But I'm not going to declare what Texas is. That's up to those that have to live there. I love all my friends in Texas, but I have to have a little fun with them. Oh. So Jesus, he goes down into hell. He takes the keys of death and hell from those demons because they had it because of the fall of Adam. There was a system there where the righteous were on one side and the unrighteous were on the other side. Jesus crossed over to the place where the unrighteous was and he took their dominion. Now where was the place of the righteous? Well, because Abraham was the first man that became, was counted him for righteousness, God was able to set up a place that we call Abraham's bosom. And that says that in that place, the people were in Abraham's bosom. I know you've heard all these different things about hell and everything, but I'm going to believe what Jesus says above everybody else. Okay. I'll listen to 17 prophets talking about hell. Well, did you listen to what Jesus said? Because maybe he's the, he's the best of the prophets. He talked about a place where there was a chasm between the two. And those in the other place could see a cross. And one of them was crying out to Abraham. And saying, Father Abraham, can you sin? And that was his name. What was the name of the beggar? Hmm? Lazarus. That's not, it might have, I can't remember it. But he said, can you send him to take, huh? To yeah, to dig, just to dip his finger and give me one drop of water. Now, you know what? It was the guy that was sitting at his gate every day that he had boils on him, and he didn't, he didn't, you know, he could have helped him, he's a rich man, didn't help him out, could have done something for him, could have helped him out, but you know what, he, he never, after he died, he never got any more revelation, he still thought that guy was a servant, he still thought that guy was a beggar, he didn't recognize him for who he really was, that's one of the things that Satan does, he does not allow you to recognize people for who they really are. Well, think about it. How many people do you know in the past you looked at them a certain way and that's to, in your mind, that's who they are. But you know what? That's not who they stay. 
Because people grow, and you have to look at them when they grow and say, oh, you're something different. You're somebody different. To see people for who they are. So Jesus, he takes the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Says he leads captivity captive, and of course they open up the graves in Matthew 28. I think some of the traditions say there were like 500 people that came out of the graves, testifying all over Jerusalem. Imagine, imagine people taking the grave, getting their glorified bodies. Oh my God. Walking around Jerusalem, testifying of these things. This was an amazing time. And because we are the sons of God, we cannot compromise our faith to be I'll just, you just need to believe in Jesus and then one day and then suffer here on earth and one day you'll get to heaven. <laughs> well, I want to know, I want to know if Jesus welcomes me there. I do not want to be denied. Let me live, let me live in that. It's a quartet, so it's hard to do it. <laughs> in that city so square, that's enough for me to know. Well, I want to know... No, that's not enough. We're the sons of God. The creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And you, my dear prayer warriors, you are the ones that are going to get the revelation. But, but people prayed years ago. They didn't pray as much as you do. And you know what? They didn't live in the time that you live in. We're living at a time when more revelation is being poured out. And those who are praying, they're going to take hold of that revelation. All right. Thank you for that one amen, Gina. Everybody else, I don't know what to say. All right, Acts 5, verse 27. And when they brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, Did we not straightway or straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I'm talking about the blood of Jesus, but it wasn't, that wasn't what they were trying to do. They were trying to show that through his blood, they could be saved. But this is how a legalistic mind thinks. Then Peter and the other 11 apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost. So people say, you need to be a witness. You know, there's, there's Jehovah Witnesses. But they don't witness by the Holy Ghost because they don't even believe in Him. But He said, we're witnesses, but so is the Holy Ghost. So there's no witnessing without the Holy Ghost. Ha, huh, I want to tell you about Jesus. He loves you. What? It may not be terrible, but we're supposed to be witnesses by the Holy Ghost. It says, also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. That, in other words, that believe in Jesus, you obeyed by believing in Jesus, you were given the Holy Ghost, and we are now this race of super beings called the sons of God. Not angelic beings, not any other created type of beings. One day you will understand, I don't know if you'll understand it here on earth, but one day you will understand that you have authority and dominion over all of heaven and earth, like under your father. You don't have authority over him. You don't have authority over Jesus because he's the head. But all created beings. Now listen, that doesn't mean if you get out of line, the angel can't say, hey, back off, buddy. They can because they're serving God, not you. When they serve you, it's because God has told them to. But we are the height of the creation of God. And once... Listen, we're supposed to be stepping into this now in the next generation. Once we figure out who we are, we're going to be creating universes and all kinds of things. I don't know everything we're going to create. But you're going to say to me, hey, Bob, look, come here. I created a new universe. Here's the most fun planet. You want to see it? Yeah. You know, a couple months later, you know, I mean, because there's no time there, but a couple months later, we explored the planet. Man, that was, that was a lot of fun. Oh, that, that wasn't even the best one. best one's over here. <laughs> we don't know of everything that God has for us. It's beyond our comprehension. We're not going to be sitting around watching TV, that's for sure. <laughs> we might watch some TV, but it's going to be like live TV, like the, 
They come by you. Oh my God, you're in the middle of it. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them, but they couldn't. So when you witness, it's the Holy Ghost that bears witness with you. That's why you always listen to the Holy Spirit. I knew this one guy, he was what I call a high personality. He just talked all the time. Like he just, all you do is just pull the string and he just, and you don't have to say a word. You could be there three hours. You wouldn't have to say a word. <laughs> say every once in a while, just nod your head. The only way you could talk is if you interrupted him. Which, if you were going to have a conversation, that's what you had to do. And I remember we were doing a program with Kim Clement, and, and uh, it was my, him and myself and somebody else. It had to do with the earthquakes and some things that were going on. And um, he did so good on that program. I was, just, I was like blown away. I was like, and I, what, listen, he was a very positive person. It wasn't like the, he was just saying bad junk all the time. It was always positive, but it was just like, okay, give me a, a rest. I just need a break. Um, but I just, I was blown away by how good he was on the program. And I, afterwards I said, man, I'm so impressed. You did such a great job. And I was, I was so impressed. And he goes, well, I just only said the things the Holy Spirit told me to. I wanted to say, maybe you should do that all the time. <laughs> I don't know if that would have went over. All right. Mm. Let me tell you, maybe tell you another story. I'm looking at the time and thinking. You know, being baptized with the Holy Spirit and the ability to speak in tongues like you guys have been doing. And I can't even tell you how much I appreciate you coming in early to pray. And then those of you that come in at other times to pray, you have no idea what's happening to you. Transformation that's taking place in your life. And I was, the Holy Spirit brought this back to me. Um, I was back in Detroit with Kim Clement, and when I would go there, of course, I was just praying a lot as a whole. But when I would go there, I would get up early, and I, and I would get up early to pray. I mean, sometimes we go to breakfast or maybe do, go to the mall or do something. But then, you know, hours before the meeting, I, always, I would always pray the whole time. So I'd always be, I would always be in prayer. I wasn't speaking, but I was always praying. And I remember one night, Kim said, he goes, he, he, I forget exactly what he was talking about. He goes, we're going um, to have the choir. They're going to, you know, be training them. They're going to come out and pray for you and and he says, and he says, Bob, Lance, I want you guys out there praying for people. So everybody out there start praying for people. And the first person I come up to has cancer. I lay hands on him and I start to pray and suddenly this demon manifests. Ah! And Dan, so she's on the ground, casting this demon out in sickness and it's drawing a little crowd. The very next woman that I pray for, she has a demon. <laughs> And it comes screaming out, and it's screaming. Suddenly, I got like a large crowd to the point where Kim's looking over, what's going on there? Like, what's, what's all the commotion? I'm pretty sure that in that building that night, nobody had prayed more in the Holy Ghost than I had. So God, knowing that he had somebody there doing that, he got the right people in front of me. He got the people that needed it the most. They both had both these women had cancer. And I, I remember the first one told me, she says, cancer. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I get to cast that thing. I get to pray, you know. And I was excited to pray for her, but the moment I started praying, yeah, and just the demons just manifesting. By the time I'm hitting the third person, now, man, I've got like a couple hundred people around me wanting to see what's going to happen next. But I was just a guest, you know, and what happened, Bob? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The Holy Ghost, when you put the Holy Ghost in con contact with demons, the demons cannot suffer his presence. They cannot be in his presence. And so you can tell so many Christians don't pray in the Holy Ghost because they come into contact with a demon, nothing happens. That's not, that's nothing going on. 
But when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, those demons, they become nervous. And I was just telling some friends this story the other day when uh, years ago I was, I was preaching in Lance Walnut's church in uh, Rhode Island. And uh, in the midweek meeting, I'd done some teaching and somebody came up to me afterwards and they said, hey, I, I want to bring somebody that you know, has a demon. Can you cast it out of them? You know, on Sunday or whatever. I said, sure, you know, bring them. And so I forgot about it, but what was I doing? Well, I wasn't just going around sightseeing. Now, I would say extra days and I'd go sightseeing and, and uh, Kim and I took kind of a vacation with Lance and Annabelle and they showed us all around the area. But, but when I'm preaching, I'm working. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to sightsee all day and then go preach. Well, because you know, you have, you know stuff. You know, you can get up there and say stuff. That to me is, that to me is wrong. So I'm praying pretty much day and night. And um, I had a couple words of knowledge, and I pray, you know, call some people up, and I'm praying for a couple people, and God's healing them. So it's, you know, it's, we're having a good time. And I get to this one woman, and the moment I touch her, yeah! <laughs> and she just goes to the ground. And then all of a sudden, this man's voice starts, man's voice starts speaking out to me. <laughs> now I'm laughing because it's just too funny. Oh, aren't, you, aren't, you, aren't you afraid of the devil? No, but you remember the scepter of righteousness, the vision? So we're not, I'm not afraid of the devil. <laughs> Even when I didn't know that maybe I should be afraid, I wasn't afraid of the devil. That's what I heard myself say. I was just a very young Christian. So I got the scepter of righteousness. So I'm not afraid of the devil. And I remember just laughing. <laughs> As the devil was speaking with like a man's voice from a woman. And, um, you know, I have a good sense of humor. So I said, a couple of women were there, so I said, just pray for a second. And I stepped away, and then she calmed down when I stepped away. So I laid hands on a couple of the people to get them healed, because I thought this might take a minute or two. So I wanted to pray for a couple of the people. Then I came back over. The moment I got in front of her, the demons start manifesting. And so at that point, I said, well, I just got to deal with it now. And I got kind of past my humorous thing. <clears throat> so I cast some spirits out of her. And... Um, I said, what was that, Bob? When those intercessors were praying for her, why didn't, why didn't she react with them? They weren't full of the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, but they weren't full of the Holy Ghost. So you can have the Holy Ghost, but not necessarily be full of the Holy Ghost. And she, she said to me, because afterwards I, we got her delivered, and I was kind of ministering with her and talking with her. And um, she said... She said, when you came up to me, she said, there was like a white tornado around you. And she goes, I just, I, I, the, the thing that was in me couldn't stand it, was in terror. <laughs> Don't you love terrorizing demons? They deserve it. She said, it was in terror. What was, this, what was that tornado? It was called the wind of the Holy Spirit. So, I'm a great believer in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer and what happens when we pray. Now, I'm going to say that a majority of the church does not. And in a church even like ours where we believe that, I don't know how many people practice it. I'm sure some, some hours a day here and there. But I, I'm trying to get us to a place where we're practicing it and I believe that we have the right people here to do it. And we have enough people here to do it. And all those people that Rodney saw, all those people that are going to be coming in, a lot of them are going to need to be delivered. And you know what? When they sit next to you, some of them might come in. Some of them may not be hardly able to come in because of the demons. And they sit next to you. The demon might manifest right next to you. Why? Because you're so full of the Holy Ghost. And so you're just going to have to deal with them right there. So, I'm going to get Bob to help. No, you don't need my help. You got the Holy Ghost. He'll help you. Somebody around you will come and, come and help you. Uh, you're going to cast that thing out. You're going to drive those demons out. Demons cannot stand the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what else can't stand it? Your soul. It will bring your soul into the right alignment. All right. I think we, I think we talked enough about that tonight. I didn't get as far as I thought I would get. But that's okay. Because we have next week. So let's stand up. 
And we are going to do a little practicing speaking from our spirit, but I'll make it a little easier tonight, a little <clears throat> less intrusive. But first, for those that are watching online, I want you to know we love you and we appreciate you. And I do pray for God's grace to be with you because you're going to need it more this year than ever. And you know what? It's going to be more powerful. The grace of God's going to be more powerful to you this year than ever. So I pray that God's grace is with you this week, that his kingdom, his righteousness, peace, and the Holy Spirit would be with you. I love you and I appreciate you. And all of us here appreciate you and we pray for you. Have a great evening. We'll see you hopefully Saturday. All right.